This first one is from a series called Baseball. Um, it was made in 2003. It's a dye diffusion transfer print, which means a gigantic Polaroid. These Polaroids are about 16 by 20 inches, typically. Um, they're made on a large format, six by 16 by 20 camera. Um, and so this is the first example. This work's called Untitled. This work is from the series American Beauty, made in 1989, another large Polaroid titled, un titled Untitled. Uh, this this uh, photograph is from The Passion, made in 2005, Passion series, also titled Untitled. Uh, this was from the series Space from 2007, titled Untitled. This is from 1994, Wild West, the series Wild West, titled Untitled. You're seeing a theme with the titles here, so I'm not going to talk about the title unless it changes. So this is from the series Space 2007, another large Polaroid. This is a gelatin silver print, a black and white print, uh, made in 1974. This one's from the series Hitler Moves East, which is his most popular and early series of work. Uh, 1983, from a series Modern Romance. And this is back to the first photograph. So this is a 2003 large Polaroid, typically 16 by 20 or 20 by 24 inch Polaroid um, print. And so we can just dive in and start talking about it. So yeah. I was wondering, um, I've looked at Leventhal before. Uh, does he exclusively shoot miniatures? I would say that 99% of what he does is miniatures. I think I may have seen some other things, but it's always in this kind of constructed environment. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's shot like porcelain figures before also that are a little risque. He's, uh, that series is called Bondage, and it's like these female nude figures that are in bondage. It's very dark <laughs> mm. but uh yeah so he he it's usually figures figurines toys and then he creates uh kind of this diorama for them to be placed in and then he lights it right. i think if you go online you can see some of the dioramas that he's created to photograph yeah does he have a series of like they're almost like crime scenes like dead bodies floating in rivers and things like that possibly it might have been from that romance series like right. the idea that they're like you know uh, what do you call it? Like noir kind of. Right. Thing. Yeah. 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 It's really amazing what he's able to do with the dioramas and the camera lens really to create uh, like this image right here that we're looking at. I think obviously it's a miniature, but it's not shot like most miniatures. It feels like our camera is in that world rather than this, the general sense where when you're frequently short shooting miniatures, you get that, um, oh, what is it called? The, the sort of lenses they use now to make it really look like to make um, normal scenes look miniature, where you've got that super narrow oh, focal yeah. area. Um, right. The depth of field is just so narrow. But even with that, I, I feel like he just has such a control of that background so that it actually feels less miniature and more um, to scale. It's really interesting. Yeah. And it's, you know, this is obviously a catcher getting ready to catch up like a pop fly or something like that. Right. Um, it's in, it's, it's, it's made to make us think that it's in the evening, you know, a night game or something. Um, but there's these really strong, you know, that light is shining like right in the guy's face, you know, it's strong lighting and you're like, is this guy even going to be able to see the ball? It's almost, and this is where the Christian part of me starts popping in is almost like this guy is having like a religious experience. You know, his hands are up in the air, yeah. the strong light is coming down and hitting him right in the face. I mean, it's almost as if on some level, you could see this as a conversion happening, you know, like it's amazing, you know, I, and I hadn't really even thought about it until we just now when we started talking about it. Yeah. I was but thinking the, the same thing. That, it looks like the annunciation or something like that. Yeah. Like he's getting, he's being spoken to, you know? Um, but it's like, like I said, it's in the evening. You don't really see any other figures around him. It's almost like he's alone. 
home, like in the wilderness, you know, and yeah. in his own wilderness of being like in a base at a baseball game. So it's like, it's, it's amazing the stuff you, when you stop, and this is what happens a lot, you know, I work at, I work at a museum. So a lot of the time people, you know, the average time people spend in front of a work of art when they're interested is two minutes, you know? So the idea that if you really slow yourself down and start looking at the artwork and start, you know, thinking at it from different perspectives, you can really start to draw in a lot of other, you know, ideas or thoughts or narratives, you know, that you want to start creating. And this is the place to do it. And you're creating narratives within a work of art is the place to, to, to do this kind of thing, to speculate and start to think about bigger ideas. Right. So it's interesting too, to think about, there's a lot to talk about with this image, especially to give evidence towards that sort of, well, I think part of this, part of this exercise of us thinking about things and talking about them from a religious point of view is, I think there's always going to be that question haunting us of, well, is that a legitimate interpretation? Mm -hmm. And I think it is when you go, when you look at the things that he's looking at, they deal with things like, identity and the mundane and specifically a lot of Americana kind of, um, they remind me of the writings of Walker Percy of some, to some extent of like, what is it like to sit on the beach? What, what are, what are in general, your average woman sitting on the beach? What is she thinking about? What is she trying to portray? All of these senses of identity and, and pushing forward a personal meaning. And I think that when we look at this, I think, I don't think it's that far off to think that this actually is an enunciation scene because he's using miniatures. We know, and, and looking at the skill at which he reproduces a scene, he's in control of every element. And if he was trying to portray a baseball game, there'd be an umpire there. There'd be a right. baseball bat on the ground. There right. would be, you know, the, the people in the background, but this is a lone figure. And I think what he's doing is he's, using the miniature to think about these mo very mundane moments in time. What other action is there that you generally, you like, I just like the symbolic exercise of this. The catcher tears off his mask and looks to the sky. It's like they're like, like that alone is so poignant an image of he has to remove the thing, which is, is there to protect him from the activity he's engaging with in order to, find the target in the sky and to successfully catch it obviously but there's like that is a powerful movement for a human to enact and i can't think of any other reason why someone would do that except for i start thinking of things like september 11th when when many people were sort of you know looking you know i think of like a welder removing his welding mask to look at those two towers when else would a welder ever do that but the catcher is a person who's constantly doing that and that's just a really interesting moment to capture um, and to think about. To me, it, it makes me think about those mundane gestures, those mundane mo moments. How can they relate? It also reminds me, I have a pastor friend who's, um, he was a baseball player in, in co uh, college and he loves baseball. And I think he really does find religious experience in baseball and I, I imagine he would really enjoy this image if, if he, if he was able to take the time to enjoy it. I don't know. Right. Yeah. Well, plus the idea, you know, you mentioned the, the person being the catcher, they could, he could have used any other, you know, player in the field. And the idea that this person is, you know, the, his name is about receiving something, you know, like it's very interesting. And like you said, and I, and I, it would be not interesting. And we, you know, at some point, I honestly believe that I, we could probably talk to David Leventhal and this is not me trying to be uh, in the live scenario, but like, I think there's a, there's a, there's a chance we could actually get him to come in and talk about this stuff. But, you know, it's, 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 it's interesting. There's two things going on. It's interesting to know what the artist's intent is, obviously, you know, mm -hmm. but the, but the thing is, and, and this is very well known in the art world that you can't control the the narrative, you know, like you can't right. control it. You got to release it out there and then let people experience it, you know, you know, where they're at, you know? So whatever you want to bring to a work of art is completely acceptable. And if anybody tells you that it's not acceptable, then they don't know what art's about. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, you've got to really accept that you can, 
that you can come to a piece of artwork and interpret it on your own. And if you want to get more involved with it and find out what the artist's intent was and find out, you know, more about the artists and their personal life or, you know, how this was constructed and all the other things that you can do, you can do that. But that's not the point of producing the artwork. The point of producing the artwork is to express an idea or express your creativity. And, you know, people aren't necessary, you know, I would, I would say typically that artists aren't there for you to, you know, explore them. You know, it's, it's, they want to, sh they're sharing their ideas, which I think they put to much more greater, you know, a much more like, they place a much more importance on the work, I think, than their, than themselves. You know, they, they feel like the work is going to be eternal and they're going to be, you know, they're going to pass away, but they, they, but they really, their purpose is to really share, you know, their ideas or their, their contemplations. And, and so I think that's the most important thing typically to artists. Yeah. I don't, I would, I would just change the one word. I don't think they're sharing their ideas. I think they're sharing ideas that they've found in the studio practice, which, you know, that can involve not being in a studio, but I think like Leventhal here, I don't know how many photos he takes, especially because he is using this Polaroid. It, it might be that, the film is rather, or the negatives are rather expensive for that. But I, I'm certain based on the amount of time and skill it would take to create this composition, this diorama, that he was taking photographs, thinking about composition, rearranging, adjusting, and found this one. I don't think he thought it up personally. Maybe he did. Um, but I think, I think most really, really powerful art is something that the artist happens upon and is awake enough to see it happening and realize there's something going on here. They might not even know what it is. I remember watching a great, the, the behind the scenes documentary for the film Magnolia by PT Anderson. And there's a really great instance where he's sitting there talking about it and he says, I think we're making one of the most powerful stories ever told. And I personally, that's one of my favorite films. I really think it is, but it's that, that lack of confidence that he had there of, he didn't even really know what he was doing until he's halfway through. And he realizes we're onto something with this, like this, there's, there's something strange happening and clearly we need to be vigilant and try to capture it. And I think especially in photography, that idea of capturing those moments. I think that that's the, uh, my, my wife is a photographer and um, well, and I'm talking to a photographer here. Uh, obviously I think you have more experience in this, but I would argue that the, one of the distinguishing skills of the photographer is that presence of mind to, to realize that a moment is coming that needs to be captured. And, Cause I don't think, I suppose now you can make arguments with video, video and film movies or whatever, that there is some element of that in that field as well, which obviously they're, they're technically very related, but um, I don't know, drawing, painting, sculpture, there's no ability, ability in those to capture a moment like how a photograph actually does. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, you know, even with photojournalism, you know, there's, there's photojournalists aren't walking around constantly taking photographs. You know, there, there are moments they can sense when the moments about, like you said, about to occur. And then they'll, they might shoot off, you know, back in the film days, they might shoot, shoot off two rolls during that moment, you know, and then find that one image that represents that moment, but they're not, they're not sitting at an event for, you know, six, seven hours or, you know, spending the whole day somewhere uh, just taking pictures, you know, it's, they, they, right. you know, it's, it's when, when it comes down to what they're wanting to represent, there's, there are a moment where you, where they start to kind of, the, you can see where it's starting to occur, you know, so right. I, like, I agree, I agree. I think it's very, I think it's very similar to what you're talking about with the studio is that you're slowly building up to that kind of crescendo, you know, like, that's it. That's the, that's the moment right there. 
and you know, Leventhal, you know, would make you know, additions. And so this, you know, the things that would change would be the way that came out. So the Polaroids are a positive image. So, you know, right. like with any Polaroid. So once he pulled it out, the only things that are going to be changing are the things around the edges where how the chemistry kind of gets squished onto the Polaroid paper. But this image here isn't going to change. There might be some variations in the, how the chemicals work. But, uh, but yeah, that, that one image, the way it's framed in the image and the lighting and everything, that's, you know, once you hit that moment, then that's when you make the addition. So. Right. Well, and to, that, that gets me thinking to further, we, we might just end up only talking about this one image. Um, it gets me thinking further. So to, to wonder what Leventhal was onto, if, if, especially if, if I'm going to keep running with my idea that, uh, that artists, particularly photographers are waiting to catch that moment. It's like, well, a very easy contrary narrative is the fact that Leventhal is making miniatures dioramas and shooting them. There's no moment to catch. He's constructing that moment completely. But I think that it's that element of, uh, he had to make this entire world and in it, there's a lot going on. And I bet you he makes a lot more that he doesn't ever show and, or, or, you know, he photographs and it didn't work. And I think that that's along the lines of, even still with the amount of control he has, there's so much going on in even just this one image of lighting and background and, and focus and depth of field and all those different things that it's impossible to imagine an artist who thinks up this image in their mind and then is able to perfectly execute it without responding to the way that the particular lighting was working on that day the way that the enamel on the figure is reflecting the light. It's like the, he was looking for, to make a photograph and for some reason chose to think about the idea of baseball. And somewhere along the lines, he found this composition that is so perfectly, in my opinion, an enunciation. I've been, I keep thinking about those two white spots behind his hands yeah and how it's like it's like illuminating the hands almost uh right you know like you you would ha you half expect to see stigmata breaking out on the hands or something <laughs> right. yeah plus that center line coming down through the middle in the background i mean it's it's right. obvious he's receiving something you know right so yeah the more you look at this the more you can start to pick up on little you know and and, and to be honest you know maybe the the intent of some of these things that we're seeing in here weren't complete you know, I'm, I almost can guarantee you that, that Leventhal added the contrast in the background to get that glove to come off so it's not hidden in the darkness of that band, that dark band. Right. right. So he added the two little white spots. But like the line coming down in the background, you know, like it's, there are some things that are going to be incidental that you can read into on your own that, that the artist may not even been trying to do. But at the same time, it's, 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 uh, you got to consider how it's really speaking to you, like you personally, you know, it's, and that's, that's very, very important with artwork, you know, it's, and that's why there's so much of it, you know, <laughs> like it's, everybody has a way of connecting to all sorts of different types of artwork and, and what's represented or not represented. So I think it's important to just, when you're, when you're looking at artwork, it's very important to bring your own history to it. So, you know, so that's well, and it, it's, it's interesting too because I'm not a I'm not a big fan of sports and everything, but even just this time we've spent with this image now, I am thinking about catchers in particular very differently than when we begun. Yeah, and and it's going to stick with me at least for probably a few weeks, if not a, if not a while longer. <laughs> right. Well, it's going to stick with us for a lot longer because we're the ones talking about it right now. So <laughs> right, right. So let's move on to the next image if I can get this to go forward. Okay, well, let's use this obvious religious image. Right. Um, so I think now, instead of interpreting, we can we can do a lot of interpretation on this also. Um, but I think the I mean, it's clearly a religious scene. It's clear, clearly in our wheelhouse. <laughs> yeah. Um, but just 
just think about how this is being represented. You know, it's like we are, you know, it's, it's, it's trying to be considered a document. So it's like, you know, Leventhal is trying to give us a, a time in history, you know, and, and how this is represented. You know, we're looking over the shoulder of Christ, you know, looking at these Roman figures and it's, it's, it, the way that it's set up, it really draws you in to like, you are really kind of there with the Christ figure, you know? So you don't see his face, you're kind of on his side and you're kind of drawn into this image um, with these, you know, guards um, that, that also seem to have some kind, they're having some kind of revelation themselves between each other. One seems very struck by the presence of Christ. The other one's looking from over at the, at the, at the guard that's kind of having this revelation. And so it's, it's an interesting scene when you still really start to look at the details, the red, you know, background is very interesting. It really brings, you know, it's, it doesn't make you feel comfortable. Um, it almost looks like a dystopian world in the background. So yeah. it's, it's interesting that he would choose that kind of background for this situation because it's, you know, um, you know, I think this is supposed to be at the time, you know, this is the resurrection is how I'm seeing it. Oh, interesting. I wasn't seeing it that way at all. Oh, really? Okay. Well, go ahead and uh, go ahead and jump in and give me. Could it? Yeah. I'm trying to think, could it, uh, that's what I was wondering is what scene is he trying to portray? Or it could um, be when he's being arrested. That could another be it. That's where I, my mind okay. was going something like that. Like Christ. I'm not seeing any like holes in the hands or. Right. And like, like Christ is headed into this sort of, I, I think, I mean, so it's called passion. It's from the series passion. So it'd be interesting to see the rest of the series to place it. Cause it might be right. after um, but the scene itself taken by itself, I don't know. I think maybe you can see it as, as either the resurrection or beforehand. My thought was that it was beforehand. I thought he was like, I think before going with more them. Sense because the dystopia in the background, right. They believe that there's something horrible. He's, he's moving into something horrible. Well, and then that red starts to mean something like pain, blood, death, yeah. suffering, but it also, I think in cap, encapsulates the idea of passion and love right yeah it's really interesting too how um the he's able to make us take miniatures and toys so seriously right yeah um part of it i love how how simple things like illustrations and cartoons how complex they can get and how we can really suspend our disbelief so much I think that we get a little bit of that here too, where it's like, I take this image quite seriously, even though I know it's like a toy Jesus. In fact, it reminds me a lot of the, uh, what was it the dog dogma movie that has the like buddy Jesus that oh, points right, his yeah. fingers. Yeah. It, the plastic quality has that same shine in this image, unlike the catcher's image. Um, and it, it, it feels significantly faker like as in it doesn't I think of it more as a miniature than the catcher one mm -hmm. but um but it's still that doesn't matter it feels like a a hyper intentional um like like you might see a diorama at a church or something around the time right. of the passion right. where they're trying to show like the give you know f generally for children the idea of what it was like or something like that with these figurines and this is such a bizarre composition you can't imagine like this being shown to children you know like we want to see the face of jesus not be left behind by him right well see and that's a good point too is the fact that we are you know in 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 the situation you know we are kind of you know we are leaving him you know to to go through this process you know to go through uh the the, the passion you know it's it's interesting that that's 
how you see it also is that we're behind that we're that he's the one taking on this responsibility and that we're going to witness it you know it's it's very interesting to think of it that way too um but i also wanted to talk about how the light the, how the lighting you know you mentioned the, the light around the hands the light around the hands here are is very much manipulated also you can see clearly see his left hand but it took you know i'm guarantee it took some time for him to get that 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 uh that roman figure in the right position to, so you could see the outline of his of his right hand so you know it's you th you look at these things you know and you think you know you could you, you, you know just threw it together or something, or it's, it, these are so simple and they're, you know, they're toys and, but he took a lot of time, you know, putting these together and making, you know, a, you know, thinking about the composition, you know, the, the areas in, on the lower uh, corners, you know, that's, it's, it's, that are in darkness and these figures kind of emerge from it. I mean, I wish I could see the original cause I'd like to see what this little plant thing is down by the robe is. Yeah, yeah, but uh, well, he he also even just with his camera positioning, it's uh, we're we're intentionally I would say the lens the center of the lens is right at Christ's eye level. Mm -hmm. I, th I think almost perfectly because both the Roman soldiers one seems to be a millimeter above Christ's eye and the one is on the right is a millimeter below, and I think that my line is right in between those two eye lines. Yeah. Very interesting. The frame. But even that it. slight that slight adjustment, you know, it really makes the figure on the right like they're looking up, and the, the and the figure on the left is really is something's happening to this person. You know, it's it's. Well, can, with with really that hand reaching towards them. Yeah, you, yeah, and you can't really. Yeah, that's a good point. The hand is like touch. You know, it's almost touching that figure on the left. Um. And it's interesting that that's the hand that's lit up and the hand on the right is kind of in darkness, almost alluding to the fact that the guy on the right is still in darkness. The figure on the left is in the light. So it's, right. you know, when you sit, like I said, when you sit here and it would be great if we could see the original, cause then you could see even more detail. But, you know, if you take your time and you want to bring your history and your feelings and your thoughts, your worldview to artwork, you know, you can really find a lot of things in there that if that two minutes, two minutes isn't going to do it. You know, you need to really spend a lot of time and just look. Yeah. And, start well, to and, think. and even that sense of we were talking about the artist's intention before. And again, I don't know Leventhal's intention here, but even if let's presume it's from our point of view, one of the most, you know, let's say he thinks that this is a joke. That's why it's miniatures. He thinks Christ is a toy and all of that it it's interesting to understand an artist's interpretation of their work but like i said earlier that's why i don't think it's their ideas they they happen to be the one who manifested those ideas in the world or these images in the world but um and they happen to have their own opinion as to what they might mean and how they might be affected personally by those images as well but even if leventhal thought this was an incredibly uh, scathing, we'll say scathing um, critique of the passion story. I mean, I can't help but notice this is 2005 and Mel Gibson's film, The Passion, came out in the summer of 2004. And, and I just wonder how, you know, was he responding to that? Was he, you know, either saying that that film was a joke or or not important even if he was i can still have this interpretation of this piece where i see this as a very um a bizarre incident on on thursday night i think of holy week is what i would say <laughs> cool all right well let's go to another image Can you tell you me stick with Leventhal or do you want to switch to a different artist? Like, let's just do one more. Yeah. Let's just, let's just stick with Leventhal and make it, make it Leventhal day. Okay. Um, I was wondering, can you, I know I've seen the, this one, the, uh, oh, although that one's uh, funny too. Can you go to the uh, Hitler one really quick? Yeah. You want to do this one? 
Sure. I don't. So I've seen this image before. I don't think I ever realized it in the context of that it was David Leventhal's. I'm wondering, can you tell me about this series more? So this series, and this is this is so much of like male, you know, childhood, you know, growing up kind of thing. Where, and this is kind of, I think, kind of where Leventhal comes from. You know, because a lot of these are toys, I think a lot of what he talks about and what he's trying to represent is this idea of play and, you know, like how serious, even as children, we get involved with these, with toys and our, and kind of the narratives that we create. Yeah. So this is, this is a series where he had self, he, this is actually his, I think one of the first, if it's not the first, it's like right in there with what he was doing at the, at the time. Before This is the first book that he actually published, from what I understand, as Hitler Moves East. So he did this series, of, and it's obviously black and white film, real grainy, but he did this series of, of just different scenes. They're all Nazis. There's no other, you know... Uh, uh, force, you know, axis force that's involved in the imagery from what I've seen. And it's either Nazis being blown up or Nazis doing their regular thing where they're driving around in their, you know, motorcycles with the sidecar or they're moving their tanks in or moving their tanks out. And so, um, so what, so what he's done is, is like you said, you know, this is in 74. So like nobody's taking pictures of toys in 74. <laughs> and making them yeah. into narratives or like being this serious about it um, where they create a whole book from it. So, so the photograph, um, the, the things, so it's 1974. So this is like 30 years, you know, after the war, you know, after the war ends, World War II. Um, right. I mean, right around that time. Yeah. Um, so he, uh, produce this work and this is these are the some things that I want to talk about with the work too is the idea of you know censorship you know like he, he has some other work also where he has figurines that are in blackface and and I had thought you know that's not a sensitive thing to kind of talk about or represent an artwork so visually because the because the visuals are just you know really malformed heads of people in blackface or, or black figures, you know, that are, that are just really kind of not, in my opinion, appropriate. And it's like the whole Aunt Jemima thing, you know, let's get rid of that because it's, you know, whatever reason. Um, but the same thing here with the, with the, with the Hitler moves East images is that it's, it's focused on the Nazis. It's focused on, the evil, you know, and, and I always wondered, you know, like is ever, is, has or would Leventhal ever get blowback for creating these images? Because they're, you want to look at them, you know, you want to engage with them. And most people would be like, why would you ever do that? You know, like, why would you ever want to look and, and reflect on a Nazi driving his motorcycle with a machine gunner, gunner sitting in the sidecar? You know, it's just like, I just wonder if, at times if, the, if culturally it's ever going to be unacceptable to look at these kind of photographs and reflect on what's going on in them, even as a cautionary tale. Mm. So, mm. so. Well, that's and, interesting. I mean, I certainly hope not. I think, I think that that kind of sentiment would come from the idea that if you are making these sorts of images, you are condoning what the images represent. And I think that if, if, you, if someone believes that they are being immature, to say yeah. the least, <laughs> the idea that Leventhal might, in, in 1974, uh, someone in 1974 who's, uh, Leventhal was in, New, was he living and working in New York at the time? I forget. He's in New York now. I'm assuming that he's probably, right. he's probably there. Then, right. You, know. you can, so you imagine someone survives 30 plus years as a Nazi living in New York. It's just foolish. Like clearly that's not his intention. And I think it's more along the lines of, I think about like my childhood growing up and specifically the kind of uh, 
images that were represented over and over to me of war. And you get, uh, for my era, it was GI Joe, you know, a hyper focus on the American troops fighting, obviously a Cobra, a fake snake enemy. Um, and that kind of glorification. Whereas on the other hand, it's like, I think of artists like Joseph Boys, who was literally raised by the Hitler propaganda education system and those sorts of ways in which people have to deal with the fact that the Nazis existed. And not only that, but they were comprised of normal human beings. Somewhere along the line, an entire nation was captivated by an ideology that led to this image. And I think that this can be seen in that light of, if we can sit there and try to understand what it was that took normal human beings, people who were, who were bakers, who were bankers, who were all of these, you know, housewives, janitors, politicians, and all of them somehow went along with this crazy man on his march both west and east. I think that's what this is about, is like what was happening? What, what, what were they doing? Why did these little toy soldiers, why did they end up with the wrong uniform on? And, and I don't, I, that's, a, that's a hard question to answer. And obviously I think you have to, you have to start delving into some other stories, but that's, that, that's what I get from an image like this. I think about my, my uh, knowledge of World War II, especially mediated through American made video games. Like I can recognize them immediately as, as Nazis and uh, know that they're the enemy, but it's so strange to think about it in the sense of like, Almost, these are almost like propaganda images, like documentation of the glories of Hitlerdom as it spreads. Yeah. But we know that they're toys, and that's the I thing that is intriguing. Well, that's the funny thing, too, though, because I think, like you said, like you'd always, you'd never associated this image with Leventhal. I think in the, back in 1974, you know, if you were to see this image on its, set on its own, you, would, you may even think, because you can't, like, not, not like his later series, I think this this image was meant to be confusing, you know, like it was meant yeah. to be like, wow, you know, this guy Leventhal somehow got this secret image of these guys riding around the countryside going to right. kill people, you know, so like it's, it's interesting that how his and maybe, you know, maybe he did get some backlash and I'm not aware of it. But maybe he they did that people were saying like, you know, don't you that's I don't care if those are toys or not. You don't do that. Like you don't represent, you know, you don't put your heart and soul into imagery of Nazis, you know? Um, so I think maybe, you know, maybe that's why he made it a little more clear like down the road that these are, these are toys. These are, I'm just, you know, creating a narrative here. I'm not, you know, trying to secretly push some kind of propaganda on you, you know? So I think it's, it's interesting and this is one of the things that would be worth actually talking to him about is how he went from this kind of, you know, surveillance <coughs> kind of imagery. Cause it looks like, you know, the shot may have been taken through a telephoto lens, you know, somebody right. hiding out in the bushes, you know, get, this is like uh, surveillance for like, you know, they're checking on, see where they're at, where they're at, how they move, you know, and maybe taking it back to the, to the enemy, you know, the, the, in the Nazis eyes, the enemy to like, right, the allies. before an attack, you know, so it's, 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 you know, it's also interesting, you know, trying to think about it's, this is a hard one too to actually within the imagery, think about it from a Christian perspective beyond what you've already mentioned, like the, humanity part of it like we know these people were not were not good people you know you know and i don't know how many of them were directly involved with you know the genocide but you know they were out killing other people you know for a cause that you know somehow they got distorted in their mind was very good and noble 
you know, there's even the the notion that that Hitler was a Christian. You know, it's like what? Like, where does all this? How how does the religion get that distorted to make people think they can commit a genocide, and that they're somehow in the right and on the right side of history? <clears throat> yeah. And so that's kind of where I come from it on a Christian perspective. And like you said, it's like, it's wrapped up in an ideology, you know, even though, you know, let's say, you know, Hitler somehow was a Christian, but he, and he had these, you know, you, if you take the, the Christian beliefs and then you somehow bring in another ideology, you know, that you need to eliminate a whole race of people to move the better race forward. You know, it's, it's odd that, that, a Christian would let another ideology take over their humanity. You know, it's just, you know, there's, there's some things you can see, con, you know, contemporarily that, you know, kind of feed into that idea, but it's just so bizarre, you know, and like you said, it happened so fast too. It happened within months, you know, like, I mean, Hitler was around for a while before the, the Nazi party and everything kind of took everything over. But when it, took it over it happened fast you know it was a it was a it was quick you know yeah. so it's it's the same thing like there's a lot of smart so-called smart people out there that that can let an ideology kind of take control of the over their reason you know so yeah, yeah. anyway i think hitler had a lot of problems but <laughs> well and that's why i think again all of this is why we should we should look at images I think that we should be looking at the darkest times in our own pasts and in our, our entire human history because those things show us the harsh truth of what humans are capable of. We right. know that it's true because it happened. And that's where I think about the, I think about this as a, as a child growing up playing with army toys, little, you know, figurines of military men and thinking about the idea of, um, I didn't even know you could buy Nazi like GI Joe things or whatever they were apparently well, back I'm in sure the 70s. It, you know, they had but, these train, I think it came from like a train set or something, you know, where they had these train sets where right. they're like, oh, let's do this like scene of World War II. And so they probably right. had figures. Yeah, it's just bizarre to think about that from the other perspective. It's the same thing now. So there's a, uh, I, I like a bunch of board games and there's these board games called the Pandemic Legacy board games. And um, the third one is coming out soon. And uh, it all, so there's this big, you know, it's like the IMDB of board games called boardgamegeek.com. And it already has a, t people are bombing it with uh, like one star reviews. And the reason is, is because it's the theme of the board game is the Cold War. And so, of course, the heroes of the game are associated with America and the uh, folks that you're fighting against are the Soviets. And there is just a huge contingent of board game players in Russia who are giving it one star reviews before it comes out simply because they call they say it's propaganda against the Russian people. Hmm. And it's crazy to think about that from like our perspective of Germany in the 1940s is heinous, but there were Germans there who thought that Germany was improving. I mean, the, the economy was improving, their land was improving. Uh, and it's just, it's just crazy to think about a photograph like this can help you understand other perspectives. It doesn't mean that you agree with them but to understand that they exist because they're in that world. They're in the world where these guys are the heroes. We're in the world where we know they were the bad guys. Yeah. It's also uh, interesting that they're as, as Russians that they they're upset about the board game. I think the difference between German, the German involvement in the war and Russian involvement in whatever war is that, the German Germans had the Nazis, you know, they, it was very distinct who these people were, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's easy to like in a board game to represent the Nazis and not represent them 
knowing where they come from, Germany, right. but at the same time, like saying that those, that was a group of people in our country that we didn't like, you know what I mean? But when you go to right. another, like with, with trying to do that same thing with Russia, I mean, it's, there's no like clear dividing line between, you know, the group of people that were involved in the war, ho horrible atrocities and the general populace of Russia. So I can kind of see where they're coming from. You know, it's, it's, it's hard when you, you know, when that distinctions can't be that clear, you know, as it is with, with Nazis. So, yeah.